technology of cars, you know, I managed to be in a race with Mercedes when I'm a Ford Focus, but I was always in 7,000 revs, fifth gear. And it, that mentality that's formed as a player and, and understanding why and how to do things uh, has benefited me as I've crossed over the line. I was going to say, what's really interesting picked up on there is in your playing career, you played abroad, of course, as well, and we've seen some English players, even Joe Hart now, going abroad. Do you think that helps people? Do you think that broadens the, the, the football in mind to go onto the continent? I think that's a key phrase, broadens the mind culturally. Uh, it actually makes you a little bit more, and again, from a coaching point of view, I would suggest I'm more unconditional. So therefore, players upset you, disappoint you, frustrate you, anger you. But tomorrow's a new day, and it's important that you don't ever if you like, judge them by that, although you strive to, to reach your standards. And I think when I went abroad, it, it, you know, I went from that tunnel vision to helicopter and it was a real eye opener in every aspect and in every area of not just football, but it develops you as a person. And of course, when you, you, you left playing, you went into your, into your first job, of course. And what was, what, how did it come about management for you in the first, uh, in the first place? Well, you know, again, uh, you talk about earning your stripes and, and, and the 10,000 hours and whatever mm. profession you do, that's what makes you an expert or a professional. Uh, I retired early at 30. Uh, devastating for, for someone of limited ability that, if you like, was living the dream and, and had a passion and enthusiasm to play and train the best he could at everything he could do. Uh, so to have it taken away at 30 uh, was, was a shock. So, so I actually went to Spain for a break to clear my mind for six months. I'd planned almost a sabbatical away from it. Uh, and I stayed six years. Uh, and in that time, uh, again, driven with that passion or that, that love for football that, that grows when you're a player and, and you're able to grow that passion and enthusiasm for the game when you're a player because you only look after yourself uh, and, and it's a fantastic job although the pressure's there. It, it meant I, I started a football club in Spain uh, and, and coached kids from 6 to 19 which is still running now 10 years on. So I started at that age and, and built through and, and when I had the opportunity to come back to England I never had any plans. I'd settled, bought a new house, both my kids were born there in the system. But that opportunity, that, that pull on me to go and give it a go back in England, uh, first of all as a youth team coach mm. at Bristol Rovers with Paul Buckle, I had to make a decision. And, and I didn't know if I wanted to do it to that level. Uh, but if I didn't try, I would never know. And mm. Seven years on, I'm, I'm still here. Oh, brilliant to hear. And of course, uh, when I've been speaking to a few managers or, or players, they say that there's something within their career that really toughened them up, but really, you know, almost it's a, something that they learned from, whether it's been cut maybe from a youth system. Mm -hmm. Is that something that maybe from that injury that you had and had to retire early, is that something that maybe something you've learned from? Well, I think, yeah, you know, again, I've, I've had a number of career threatening injuries. I think it was 14 operations throughout, and, and to finally be. Uh, if you like, caught up mm. by it. It, it. it was tough. And I think uh, mentally it makes you stronger. I think the system that, that many years ago that I came through forms you, you know, to, to steal the, the, the Navy phrase, you know, you're born wherever, but you're made somewhere. And I think, you know, I was fortunate at St Mirren where, again, it was a full hands-on manager who really took it upon himself to give you the best opportunity to have a career. And I think, it, Every manager you ever work for or under, you learn and, and you develop. Not always good, might I say, you know, but sometimes in adversity or, or under someone that you don't quite agree with or see eye to eye, you actually learn more. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that, that, that you, you extract or mine as much information and, and knowledge to combine with the experiences in your career to actually make your opinion validated when you become a coach. Mm. And I just want to have a look as well at, at a match day because that's obviously where most fans are senior people as, as a manager. But I just wanted to start off of you know how you approach the game. You know how do you, how do you prepare for that match? Because I imagine as a manager, it's just absolutely full on. It's it's one of those jobs where it, it consumes most of your time. Well, I, I'm actually role reversal to that. Then during the week, I'm very intense. I'm a systems and process type guy, structure, organisation, mm -hmm. uh, but that's Monday to Friday. By Saturday I'm actually quite relaxed and calm in comparison to my normal persona. <laughs> uh, and that's because all the work's been done uh, and the, the, the phrase control the controllables, during the week you control what you do. 
come a Saturday, uh, you don't. Mm. Uh, I'm actually the reverse of what I was as a player. You know, anyone that sees me, uh, again, limited ability, but passion, enthusiasm, drive, you know, the, the old tackles from knee up, never mind knee down, but, but full-hearted, full-blooded in everything that I did. As a manager on the side, uh, you try to create a persona of calmness. You know, don't let emotion affect your decisions because you're judged on decisions that you make. Mm. And it's tough because your inner chimp's fighting against you because your personality. So what made me successful or, or made me cope as a player, you're fighting as a manager because what you don't want to do, you don't want to transmit that to the players. Because again, management's about the 11 that are out there and the seven on the bench. And judging them or, or expecting them to be like you it sets up for failure. Mm. And just looking still at going into a game, I know we've spoken, I've spoken to some managers, they always say, oh, it's about pre match rituals, are a bit superstitious. But the way you say you, you sort of organise and structure, do you have any pre match rituals? Are we superstitious in that sense? So no, no, again, you know, the, the structure's the same. Mm. Yeah, and I think what's important is that consistency. And, and if I'm trying to create that persona of calmness, uh, whether good, bad or indifferent, I think it's important that, that the routine's the same so emotions don't affect it. So, you know, I was never one for a poor result in on a Sunday. Mm. Good result, have Monday, Tuesday off. No, because I think then what you do, you actually attach certain aspects of the game to risk and reward, which, which if you, if you uh, take that away, you've got a better chance of, of, of reasonable success over a longer period of time. Mm. And just looking at, at half-time team talks as well, obviously, uh, that's the one thing that's, that's probably most elusive to the fan. We never get to see what happens inside a dressing room. Some people are, are quite coy on saying what happens in a, in a post-game. Some people uh, say exactly what happens. But in a sort of half-time team talk, you know, how, how important is that, uh, genuinely? Yes, uh, you know, there's a lot made of half-time team talks. But if you think of how emotionally driven players are, and although, you know, you talk about football with me, you know, I'll wax lyrical for hours. Not much sense, but I'll wax lyrical for hours because it's a passion and enthusiasm. When you're in that dress room, you know, and it's again, it's an opinion, it's a belief. Make it as simple and as clear as possible to help them do better. Mm -hmm. So try not to give more than three basic, simple instructions. And, and again, it, it's very important that the message doesn't get lost in the words. Uh, leave them for five minutes don't speak, you know, uh, and stating the obvious or, or not being happy with them. Again, human nature, how they act and react, you know, and I think people talk about, has the game changed? I don't, I think society's changed. So therefore what worked and, and, and prompted and provoked me as a player tends not to work now, mm. you know, and, and what you're looking at, what's the outcome, what you're looking to achieve, are you looking to maintain what you've did in the first half, you're looking for them to improve, and I think your tone and how you speak to them are vital in today's society to try and promote that positive reaction. Mm, there's no doubt about that. I'll pick up on that in a second as well. But one thing I want to look at is, uh, is being down at the dugout, some man, as we know, and, uh, they're, they're well known for being sent up to the stands. Um, I, do you have any sent up to that? Was that different as well from when you were a player, sort of your touchline manner? Yeah, very much so. Mm. You know, everything about my, my whole uh, attitude is different. Uh, I don't get involved with the officials at all. Uh, again, it's a conscious decision. Uh, again, I think they're only human. Uh, and people may say you influence them for the next decision, but I, I have a little bit more, if you like, naivety it would be seen with officials that, that they'll do the best they can. Uh, and we, we can disagree, but until you see it again, you don't know yourself. Mm -hmm. Whereas as a player, you know, I was very much in the face and aggressive and, and I think over 100 bookings and 10 sendings off tells you what I was as a player, where, where it's a contrast as a manager, again, not to impose what I was, mm. although making demands of players. So I think on the touchline, again, it, it, it's, it's over the period to influence the players and, and generate that, that belief that what we do all week uh, is the correct thing for them to be able to perform on a Saturday. Mm. And just one of the one on a match day as well is, is talking to the press because uh, it, it almost seems quite strange that we, we live in a world where you can come off the back of a loss, you immediately hit the press and that's something we've, I've seen quite often, it's, uh, the emotions are still running high that close to after a game. How is it dealing with the press straight after uh, a win or a loss? Tough, 
uh, you know, it, it's something that when you go from coaching to managing, uh, it's a demand on your time and energy. You have your press conference before the game. If you're playing Saturday, Tuesday, you're speaking to them three times a week. You know, some people don't speak to their wives three times a week. <laughs> and, and you find yourself speaking to people who are prompting and provoking. That's, that's the job. I think the key factor is, is understand it's not personal. Mm. It's tough at times, especially when things aren't going well. You know, the, the, the game for me consumes us or absorbs us, depending if you're doing well or not. Uh, and the press is a, a necessary evil to a degree, but it's important. And I think if you accept and, and appreciate that they're doing their job, and you know, more often than not, the difficult questions are ones you ask yourself. Uh, so therefore, uh, be as honest as you can be and as fair as you can be, because it's not always possible as a manager. And obviously there's times where I've seen it with a, a few managers where it's almost like they're swimming against the tide, uh, they're having to face the press, the press think they've gone, the fans think they've gone, but a manager is still there. Is that something you've experienced? Is that something that's, that's difficult to handle? Oh, it's tough because, again, you know, one thing is normally when you lose a game, you're no more disappointed than, than, than anyone else. You, you, you're the leader of, of the group that have just lost the game. So therefore you're responsible. Uh, so when you're being quizzed and questioned in, in, in that scenario, it, it, it's tough to control emotions, but I think it's vital. But I also think it's vital that, that we don't tend to self-preserve, if you like, because that ends up insulting the fans who watch it week in, week out. And that's where my, my, my phrase of be as honest as you can be, because there's certain things you can't reveal from in-house or, or, or different aspects. And I think it's important that you're as honest as you can be and, and, and not repetitive in particular when you're having a, 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 a bad run with it uh, because I think you gain more respect from the fans if you're like that. Mm, and just I want to uh, pick up on as well and you, you, what you were saying a little bit earlier on that, that football hasn't changed but society's changed and one thing that seems to have changed probably from the, the very start of your career to now is, is sports science and I was just wondering how important is it to you, does that play a massive role or is it something that you have to combine with, with being a bit more of an older fashion man? How, how do you approach sports science? I, I, you know, we've developed so much over the years and it's evolved, uh, but I think it's important that, that not only do managers realise, but the sports science department realise that they are a support network. Mm. They don't dictate, they support and back up. Uh, for me, it's a fantastic tool. More often than not with players, to show evidence, you know, uh, because if they can see it and it's there, it strengthens, it's not just your opinion. And I think that's important, you know, nowadays we look at facts, can we deal in facts? When you deal in facts, it's less personal, therefore they don't take it to heart and they cannot think it's a, a, a vendetta or a problem that you have with them. Mm -hmm. So therefore I think it's a very useful tool to strengthen your opinion because more often than not, what you see with your naked eye as the manager is backed up by sports science. Mm -hmm. But on the other occasion, it's not also, so therefore it changes your view on how you approach. So again, emotions affect your opinion, especially if you've lost the game. Mm -hmm. So it helps you be more analytical without, if you use it as a, as a tool, rather than dictating or determining what you do as a manager. And one thing that, that some people would say hasn't helped the game is agents. Uh, we hear a lot about them now, even though they are quite elusive still. A lot of the public don't realise some of the, the myths that are still held about fax machines and all the rest of it. But how hard is it actually dealing uh, with, with agents? No, I, I think, you know, they're part of the game. Mm. And although there's a small minority that get the, 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 the majority a bad reputation, you know, most of them, when you have a conversation, uh, they want the best for their client and you know at the end of the day that, that's what their job is uh, but most of them are reasonable I've found my dealings with agents uh, not an issue uh, in particular with younger players I think you'll find that, that they understand the, the importance of them game time and develop them before taking them elsewhere and I think if you can build that relationship with whether it be the parents that look after the kids or who influence and affect them or the agent, I think then uh, uh, you manage situations before they happen. I was just, how important is it to actually be involved with this, uh, the, the family, especially when you're trying to make a transfer with a, with a younger player? I think well, whether you're, you're bringing an experienced player or a younger player in, I think your background on what they are is vital. I think you know recruitment in terms of your criteria, 
your strategy I think it's key factor because you talk about managing players and personalities and what are they, you know, their background gives a lot to what they are and how they're going to act or react in your environment and I think that's where your due diligence is vital, mm -hmm. key factor and sometimes you've got to look beyond what they just do on the pitch, you know, the dynamics of the dressing room because when you've got 25 players in that dressing room it's very important that, that it's like a jigsaw and that they fit in and, and, and that, that the minority don't derail in particular you know in the face of adversity mm. when things are going well all dress rooms are great mm. it's when the tough times when the fans aren't happy or disgruntled when you're not getting results you know and that's where your due diligence on what type of character person they are bringing into the building and, and you know there's a big thing about leaders mm. not enough leaders in the game and again society's changed and it's it's developing them and people asking how do you develop leaders well, you've got to do your homework on what, what the, the foundation is that's coming in. You know, what's the ingredients of the person? Do they have the capacity to take on information and develop into a leader? And I think that's important when you're recruiting. Mm. And it's just like you said there, the vast majority of the time, addressing rooms a very happy place to be. But we all know that there can be situations where they're on a training ground after bad loss. How do you, how do you deal with a situation that's escalated? Just sometimes between players or a single player. In terms of? In terms of, uh, for example, there's a, there's a bit of a bust up in a training ground, even an argument or something like that. The players are obviously unhappy about a run. How, how do you deal with a sort of an escalated situation? I, I think, you know, sometimes it spills over at times. Mm. Yeah, because emotions are high, because ultimately players, fans, people that work at the club and, and the coaching staff all want the same thing. They want to be successful. Mm. And everybody has their own agenda or, or their own aims or goals. And it's important that we understand that we're working together for it. I think it, perception of fairness within the environment definitely defuses any situation or, or issues. Uh, and I think that's important. And there's consistency how you deal with things that, that crop up. And I think it's across the board. And I use the word perception because it's, it, it's a very important key factor. You know, there's always consequences for actions, good or bad. And, and if the group feel that there are consequences, but then you as a manager, depending on situation, scenario, and who the player is, mm -hmm. deliver that in certain ways or, 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 or subtly change it, then the group still feel or have a perception that it's fair. But then you're managing individuals within a group environment, which is, which is a big key factor. Nowadays, it's, well, it always has been a results-driven business, but you've sees even that anymore. I mean, you look at the Championship League One, the amount of managed turnover seemed absolutely ridiculous. Do you think that, that managers get anywhere near enough time to, to really build a squad and, and um, have enough time to put their own identity onto things and really uh, progress with a squad with that kind of stability now? I think 70 managers leaving their posts last season tells you that, that nowadays it's very short-termism. But again, I think that reflects society. We're living in a microwave society, you know, from children all the way up, whether they want instant whatever. And I think it, it, we definitely have to buck that trend. I think uh, over Europe and, and, and throughout world football, any manager that's had a period of time, you know, and stats can be interpreted whichever way you like, but you have a greater uh, level of success or chance of success, uh, you know, from, from a novice manager looking to progress, you know, I'd love time. And it's, it's, it, to, to, as you say, establish what you are, have the team reflect what you are and what the club is. But more importantly, when you go into a club, define the rules, you know, what's the goals? You know, what, what do they want to achieve? And I think if you do that at a club and, and you agree the goal, uh, along with what you've got uh, in terms of resources and people automatically assume that's budget and uh, maybe being Scottish and being rather tight with money is a <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't agree with that because mm. whatever you've got if you spend it well because you've got system and process and particularly in your recruitment or you bring in the right characters because your due diligence has been correct then you've got a chance of being successful and also the biggest resource you have at a club is people mm. including fans so it's important that you unite them, engage them, bring them together and, and maximise what you have because that's, that'll give you a degree of success. But that takes time. And, and, and the society at the moment and football at the moment is suggesting that we don't have that. 
So it is tough because do you want to assemble a team or build a club? And I think clubs have to decide what do you want, how do you want to do it? And it's a key question. And when you ask it, everybody wants to build a club, not assemble a team. But it's like the old adage of who wants change? Everyone wants change. You ask them who wants to change, no one does. So, so it's getting that balance and that, that's where I think we find ourselves at the moment. Mm. And it's, it's interesting you say that as well because there's a lot of managers that can do particularly well uh, in the first, maybe second job and still not be given another third chance somewhere else. And how hard is it to try and break back in to management after a certain period of time? Does it get harder the longer you've been out of the game, do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's a cutthroat, ruthless industry with 92 professional clubs. So 92 professional clubs with the amount of players that retire each year, become coaches, etc. So, so although the jobs aren't increasing or, or the possibilities, the amount of people going for them are. Uh, and again, we have trends, we have things that, that are more popular than not in terms of whether it's established managers, whether it's coaching type managers, whether it's, it's young up and coming managers. And, and, and I think the, the, the flux from one to the other also uh, affects your opportunity. But I, you know, from my point of view, I think a key factor is to influence a decision maker at any club you must get information about what you are through varied sources. And the easiest way to do that is continually be consistent in what you are and what you do. And I think that's a key factor. And demonstrate, so when you have the opportunity to speak, to not just say what you do, demonstrate it. And I think that's a, that's a, a really important point when, when you're speaking to a decision maker. And how important is your team around you, your number two and everyone that's in your, your backroom staff? How, how much of an impact that, that they also have? Huge, mm. huge. Uh, so much so I, I didn't realise how, how important it was and felt it's an area that I need to do better next time round. Uh, I have, and, and again it's a view based on the fact of working at clubs as a coach and knowing that I work for the manager and how the manager wants it, that's what I'll do, irrelevant if I've known him a day or ten years. So I, uh, when I went into a managerial post, my thought was give every member of staff an opportunity to show what they are. Because every manager has a different environment that he provides. Mm. And I wanted to see how they act and react under what I wanted. And, and, and it was tough. It was the right reason but the wrong action. And, and the reason I say that is because time consuming, drain time and energy, because they were great people, but to get my message across to them, there was only one person that could do it, and that was me. And everybody wanted five minutes of your time, which drained you, and, and, and something that you neglect is your own well-being. You know, you've, you've got a bucket list of things you've to do today, and going to the gym or eating properly and getting a good night's sleep are at the bottom and tend to get off the list of, of importance because you've got that much other. So if you've got someone in that, that, that understands how you work, picks it up quickly and can spread the message, it's not just one voice, it, it's, it's multiple voices with, with one message. I was going to say, how hard is it to go from, from that to uh, the, the sort of the sacking and, and not having anything like that, it just being totally cut off and, and sort of being from the manager to, to the former manager? Yeah, I think, again, if you know the rules of the game that you're playing. Uh, it doesn't make it any easier at the time, but again, can you be analytical? Can you step out of it? Can you take emotion away from when you're doing... Because what could you, should you have, would you have did better? And, and, and I think the sooner that you can and, and not have a blame culture, the better you become. And I think that continued personal development is, is, is a key area. You know, you look at people who become football managers, it's footballers, two different skill sets. Mm. Totally, and it's where you know education and, and, and development of the skill of managing in any industry, and I think they've addressed that or looking to with the League Managers Association, who are really pushing the education program on dealing with stress, resilience, managing up all these aspects that, as a player, you have no idea of. The longer you're in coaching, the more of an idea you have because you're exposed to it, but not to the level that a manager is, and I think. That's a key area that needs to be addressed. So Jamie, just finally, what's, what's next for you? Again, you know, your enthusiasm and, and passion for the game is born when you're through your, your playing for many years. Uh, when something against you goes or, or you're not 
uh, in the game. It's never dented, you know, it, it, it grows. Uh, so, so I'm looking for the next opportunity. And, you know, and what is the next opportunity, you know, whether it be managing, coaching, having did from under six right through to first team now, I'm pretty flexible and adaptable. And I'm still of that old fashioned mentality that, you know, at a football club, the football side, the football manager runs it and whatever he wants, it's a key factor that you must deliver that and be part of that and support that. Uh, so, so any opportunity that comes up that is a genuine opportunity to be successful, 